Hello everyone, welcome to today's video. On today's video, we are going to discuss yet another very important economic concept that we all must fully understand. This is called as interest rate. Now, interest rate is something which we might already be aware of. We might have heard about it. For example, we earn certain interest rate on our savings deposits. We earn interest rate on our FDs and RDs. We might already be paying interest rate on certain loans we might have taken. Hence, it is very important to understand interest rate. I will also be talking about the macroeconomic dynamics of interest rate, how it affects prices, how it affects inflation and GDP growth of any country. I'm also going to discuss another related topic, which is debt to GDP ratio. In fact, debt to GDP ratio can act as an indicator about the stability of any economy. So I'll discuss it in more detail. And finally, I will also be discussing a case study on India. I will be linking interest rate and GDP ratio to the situation where India was almost on the verge of an economic collapse and how did India emerge out of it. This is the agenda for today. Just a quick introduction about myself. I am Ayushi. I am an Indian Economic Service Officer currently working with the Government of India. I have over seven years of experience working at the intersection of economics, finance and public policy. And here I'm discussing certain very important economic concepts that all of us must be aware of in order to understand how do economies function. So let's begin the video. So the first question that we must ask ourselves is what is interest rate? So think of yourself as a student. You decide to pursue higher education, but you do not have the cash at home or with your family or in your hand to pay the fees for that higher degree. So you decide to take a loan from the bank. You go to a banker. The banker says, okay, I'll give you the money and you can repay me once you get a job after your degree. But because I'm giving you the lump sum amount right now, I'm going to charge you a premium. So in order to give you that lump sum amount right now, the banker is basically charging you a premium and that premium is termed as interest rate. Very simple, very intuitive. A similar dynamics also takes place at the level of households or individuals like you and I and corporates. So for example, households, they take loans for a lot of expenses. For example, if they want to buy a house or if they want to buy automobiles like cars and scooters or even if they want to finance other expenses like marriage of their children. So these all expenses require a certain amount of money. If they don't have the money in their hand or if they don't have that kind of cash, they go out and take loans. Similarly, corporates, in order to invest in their companies, for example, if a company wants to invest in machinery in order to produce more goods, it will again take loans. And similarly, if they want to expand their footprint, expand their company, then again, they might take loans. So this kind of borrowing happens at a macroeconomic perspective as well. Governments also borrow, but I'll discuss it when I discuss debt to GDP ratio. So basically, people borrow. So individuals like you and I, we borrow money, individuals, then corporates borrow to increase their production. So these are basically the two primary borrowers in any economy. But where do they borrow this money from? Most likely they will be borrowing this money from a bank. Now when a bank gives out loans to individuals and corporates, they would charge an interest rate on this. As simple as that. But where do banks get the money to lend out to these people? The banks can borrow from two sources. First are what are called as depositors. Now depositors are basically, again, people like you and I who have a savings account in a bank. So the savings account that we have in a bank, usually the money that is left there is not left idle. Banks use it to lend out to certain people. However, if you want the money back, banks would actually arrange from other pool of fund that they have and give you the money. So these depositors could be the people who have a savings account. These depositors could also be the people who have an FD or an RD with bank. And these banks are usually banks like ICICI, PNB, HDFC and a lot of other commercial banks. But banks also have another source which is the Central Bank of India. A central Bank of any economy. And usually these dynamics would work the same across any economy. But uh, for the sake of understanding, I'm taking the example of India here. So the central bank or the RBI in India's case would be another lender to the commercial banks. So basically central bank and these depositors, they lend to the bank. The bank in turn would give them an interest rate. 
right so for example people like you and i when we put our money into a savings account they usually give us 2 to 3 or 4% maybe right or if we put in an fd they give us 5 to 6 or 7% at the max and similarly the banks would then lend this money out to individuals and corporates and charge an interest rate from them in between the banks would earn a commission and that is how banks thrive but the most important interest rate here is this interest rate the interest rate that rbi charges in order to lend out money to commercial banks is called as repo rate it is also called as the bank rate and this is the fundamental tool through which central banks or governments they control the monetary policy of any economy so repo rates is the primary tool to control or to manage the monetary policy monetary policy is any policy that is influenced by the central bank of a country or you can also say the government of a country with me so far let's understand repo rate in more detail so rbi the central bank lends out money to commercial banks at what is called as the repo rate commercial banks lend out this money to corporates and individuals at an interest rate in between they earn certain commission or certain charges which forms their profits this is how the banking system in an economy works and this is of course a very oversimplified model but uh, in order to give you an understanding about how interest rate affect inflation and growth rate this is the model that you must keep in mind now let's think about a situation in which people have a lot of money in their hands the economy is booming gdp is growing people's income is growing and that is why they are demanding a lot more goods and services however in order to produce those goods and services that people are demanding it will take time it it is not easy to increase the production immediately right secondly corporates will have to invest a large amount into building those factories into uh, getting more equipments getting more machinery and producing those goods so all this takes time but since the demand is high and demand is not being matched with the supply therefore prices will start rising there is a lot of demand chasing lesser number of goods and hence prices will start rising and this is termed as inflation if you haven't watched the video on inflation yet do go and watch it it will give you very good insights into how inflation affects all of us so please watch that video i have linked it there now when the demand is high inflation is rising what do central banks do or what do governments do governments try to reduce that demand so how can it reduce the demand it is basically trying to decrease the amount or the cash that people have in their hands so it is decreasing the money supply in the economy how do they do that they increase the repo rate so let's see how it works so let's say that in an economy where gdp was high demand was increasing and therefore prices were also increasing which was leading to a case of inflation so when the rbi increases the repo rate in order to maintain the same level of profit that the commercial banks were earning they increase the interest rate that they were charging to individuals and corporates this means that there is an overall increase in the interest rate now it has two effects the depositors now they see that the interest that they are earning from the savings account or from the fds that is high that is why they'll start keeping the money in banks they take out the cash from their homes and start keeping it in the banks the corporates in fact have an adverse effect they see that the interest rates have increased that is the cost of borrowing money has increased and hence they will stop borrowing more they will in fact cut down on the production of goods and services that means that because depositors have kept the money in the banks the demand has fallen the corporates because they have refrained from borrowing more the supply has fallen and hence prices start falling down again this means inflation is controlled conversely if we see that there is 
not enough demand for example when the 2020 pandemic hit there was not enough demand and uh, people were not buying they were only buying essential goods there was not enough demand economy to start up the economy what did government do or what did the central bank rbi did it started to give tax incentives it reduced the interest rates it actually gave away tax incentives in the form of lower taxes for corporates for msmes for startups and this meant when the interest rate was reduced people started borrowing more individuals started borrowing more in order to meet their expenses corporates started borrowing more in order to meet the demand and hence demand started rising the supply also started rising gradually this meant that the prices started rising and hence there was seen to be a growth in the economy so basically repo rate acts as a very very delicate tool to balance the inflation in the economy now how is this repo rate decided usually what happens is that for example india targets its inflation rate india maintains its inflation rate around 4% plus minus 2% that is the limit it has so in order to target this inflation rate of 4% there is a monetary policy committee which the rbi has formed it has six members and they decide on what should be the repo rate they decide this repo rate quarterly so if you look at the news and you come across this term now it should be very clear to you why this repo rate is changed periodically this is basically based on the factors the other indicators such as gdp such as inflation that the economy is seeing so repo rate is decided accordingly now let's come to another topic which is called as debt to gdp ratio so before we move on to that let's discuss about how government finances its expenditures government finances has two aspects one is revenue and the other is expenditure so why does government need to spend it spends on different items such as law and order such as uh, defense such as building infrastructure building dams building schools building hospitals and so on and so forth right so where does it earn this money where does the revenue come from the revenue basically comes from taxes so it can could be individual taxes the personal income tax that is levied on all of us the corporate tax or it could be excise duties and gst it could be also fees and other miscellaneous charges or the cess that the government charges the expenditure is basically on different items that i discussed so there is also another way to finance this expenditure which is called as borrowing basically government takes on debt to finance the different expenditure items it has now debt could be internally that is through bonds so what is bond bond is basically a piece of paper that the government or any entity would give you in order to get some money and in return they would pay you certain interest rate so for example if i am the government i go out to you and i say hey please give me 10000 rupees i am going to pay you 10% every year till the expiration of this bond this is how governments also borrow money from the public governments can borrow internally from the public through bonds or it can borrow from the central bank again this will be in the form of bonds as well or it could borrow from foreign governments or foreign institutions such as imf etc it could borrow from foreign entities as well so this forms the public debt now let's come to the topic at hand which is debt to gdp ratio so debt to gdp ratio is the total public debt that is taken on by the government divided by the total gdp of that country i have made a video on gdp to give you more understanding about gdp what does it mean and what does it signify if you haven't watched it already do go and watch it right now it will give you a better understanding about all these terms that i'm speaking about so debt to gdp ratio gives you an indication about what the government owes in relation to what it produces so it is a good metric to understand the country's ability to repay its debt so another important aspect here is that why can't we look at the total debt that a country has taken why do we have to look at the debt to gdp ratio the important point to note here is that we cannot look at the absolute value let me give you an example here for example by the end of 2019 poland and egypt both had debt of around 265 billion us dollars 
However, Poland's GDP is US dollar 568 billion and Egypt's GDP is US dollar 318 billion. This means that the debt to GDP ratio of Poland is only 46% while that of Egypt is around 84%. What does it indicate? It indicates that Poland is at a much better level. It is producing commensurate to what it owes. However, Egypt is in a very, very dire state. It can default on its payment. The higher the debt, the lesser is the ability of the country to repay its debt. Of course, this is not true in all cases. There could be a sudden miracle and people can pay off their debts. It happens with individuals as well and it can happen with countries as well. But usually this ratio is considered to be a standard metric of the sovereign risk that a country has. Sovereign risk means that whether that country will be able to repay its debt or not. And there are different companies such as Standard & Poor's, such as Moody's, which actually give all these economies rating according to their credit history, according to their debt to GDP ratio and a number of other factors. This is the table you can see for that. So what is the impact of higher debt to GDP ratio? Higher the debt to GDP ratio, higher is the interest rate. Think about it at an individual level. If you are a student, you take on loan and you have to repay that debt once you get your job after your higher degree. But unfortunately, you're not able to get a job. But you have to meet your daily expenses, right? And you decide to take on more loan. Do you think that the person who's giving out the loan to you would be confident enough to give you loan unless and until you have some amount to show it as bank balance? No. He will give you more loan only if he's able to charge a higher premium or a higher interest rate. So higher the debt to GDP ratio, higher is the interest rate for the future loans that you take. When a country has a higher debt to GDP ratio, it also gives an indication to the investors, to different institutes, that the country is not producing enough in their economy. And hence, it can act as a market risk factor, wherein people may start, or foreign institutional investors, people who are investing from outside, may start withdrawing their money from the country. That is why you see a lot of inflows and outflows of money of capital happening across economy. Now, a way to come out of this uh, higher debt to GDP ratio is what? Simply start printing more money. Simple, right? You print more money, you can pay the debt off. But that is not a prudent way. If you haven't watched my video on inflation, do go and watch it right now. It will tell you why printing money is not the right way to tackle any crisis. It can lead to a situation of hyperinflation wherein economies can collapse completely. Higher debt to GDP ratio can also lead to a lowering of economic growth. For example, there was a study conducted by World Bank which showed that a higher debt to GDP ratio, something which is greater than 77% in developed economies and greater than 64% in developing economies can actually reduce the GDP growth rate by 0.02%, which is a huge, huge thing. So let me give you an exercise here. Japan one of the most developed economies in the world has a very high debt to GDP ratio. Currently, it stands at 235%. That means the debt that the country Japan has is 2.35 times its GDP. Do you think it is sustainable? And the second question is, do you think it will be able to repay its debt? Answer these two comments in the comment box down below and I will post my reply to this in the description box a couple of hours from now. So what happened in India in 1991? 1991 formed a watershed movement for India's economic history. It was the year in which the LPG reforms were introduced. LPG stands for Liberalized, Privatized, Globalized. Before 1991, India was tackling a number of economic issues. The rate of inflation was very high. India was tackling a very, very high debt to GDP ratio, which also meant that more creditors were not coming in to give loan to India. They were scared. They could see a sovereign risk. They did not know whether India would be able to repay its loan or not. There were other crises in the agriculture sector going on. And hence, India had to go to IMF to get more loan, which meant that it had to meet the IMF's conditions as well. And IMF insisted on opening up India to the global world, which meant that India had to reform its economy entirely. India embarked on a road to liberalize its industrial, its manufacturing sector. It started privatizing a lot of companies and disinvested from a lot of public sector companies. It also opened up its borders to the world and exports and imports increased. And this is the India that you see today. 
if there are enough interest, I'll delve deeper into the factors that led to this economic crisis in India and how India dealt with it. And this will be a separate video altogether because this is a huge topic. But this is where I close the session today. I want you to think about what are the macroeconomic factors which affect investor confidence. What are the macroeconomic factors which affect our financial markets? Because these are the subjects or these are the topics that I'll be discussing in my subsequent week. I hope you found this video to be useful. If yes, then please do press the like button. Also, if you have any suggestions for me or you want me to make videos on any particular topic, then do let me know in the comment box down below. Do answer the question that I had regarding Japan. I'll see you the next time. Till then, stay safe. Take care. Bye.